the labor situation in the United States of America. It's September 3rd, 2021, and today some important information came out about the state of the economy from the employment perspective. And we're going to go over that with Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners. My name is Emil Kalinowski. Welcome to the show. This is Making Sense. Jeff, hot off the presses, United States unemployment rate dropped to 5.2% in August 2021, the lowest level since March 2020 and in line with market expectations. The labor market continued its steady recovery following business reopenings in the U.S. and despite reports of labor shortages and concerns over the lingering threat of the COVID-19 resurgence. Labor shortages, we're going to come back to that. So that was, who was that from? That was from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Here is something from IHS Market and their U.S. Services PMI score, though it's a little bit less optimistic. Here's what they say. Service providers, and it's re reported today as well, early in the morning, service providers registered broadly un unchanged employment levels midway through the third quarter, unchanged, with marginal increase in jobs almost ending a sequence of job creation that extends back to July 2020. Companies noted significant issues retaining employees and finding suitable candidates for current vacancies. So again, that idea of a shortage. Here's a comment for, from Chris Williamson, the chief business economist at IHS Market. Growth slowed sharply in the U.S. service sector in August, joining the manufacturing sector in reporting a marked cooling in demand and encountering growing problems finding staff and supplies. Job growth almost stalled among the surveyed companies in August. Supply and labor shortages are putting the brakes on the recovery. So we're getting somewhat mixed messages. Somehow, you know, the employment situation is good because the unemployment rate is low but there's also less hiring taking place in the services sector. How do, what, how do we reconcile these seemingly kind of disparate news items? Right, I mean, I mean if the labor market, or the, if the economy is booming, that's what we hear, the economy's steady, it's doing really well, it's strong, whatever adjective you wanna throw in there, yet the labor market seems to be cooling, how do we reconcile what are essentially contradictory signals? And the answer for most people is, at least in the mainstream media, financial media, and of course from economists and central bankers, is this labor shortage. The economy is doing well. Businesses are having a robust period of, of economic growth, except they just can't seem to find enough workers to keep up with how good the economy is doing. And it sounds plausible, but yeah, we've heard this story before. We heard it not just not even very long ago, going back to 2018. And so we already have one example of a labor shortage that wasn't a labor shortage. That's something that we need to keep in mind, as well as a lot of data and evidence that suggests maybe the economy's not doing well, because that's the other way you can reconcile this, this contradictory signals, right? Is if the labor market's not doing well, maybe it's because the economy isn't actually doing as well as has been said or has been claimed. And that's really, there's really, it's somewhat of a binary choice here. Which one is it? Is it the labor shortage that's holding a roaring economy from, from really roaring and going, going forward? Or is it maybe the labor market's not really all that great because the economy's not really all that great? So that's what we need to sort out. What, which, one, which way are we moving here? Earlier you mentioned that we've gone through this before and I remember very specifically when that was. It was August, mid-August 2018, Toronto, Canada, the Macro Voices Meetup. I remember specifically you, Eric Townsend, Patrick Ceresna, and a bunch of Macro Voices fans. We were all at a bar and people were asking you about the same thing, the labor shortage. And Jeff, you brought up the idea of a market clearing wage then while I was stuffing myself with French fries and chicken fingers and beer. So I heard it. I wasn't, I kept my mouth open as I was eating, but you know, for all the people that weren't there, what is this idea of a market clearing wage? Isn't that the solution to a labor shortage? Well, there is no labor shortage. When you, when you look at it that way, it's really, are businesses paying the rate that labor would want? And if there's if there's anybody, you know, if, if you're having trouble, if you're having trouble or you're reporting or saying or claiming that you're having trouble acquire 
uh, uh, enough laborers or enough employers or employees, um, then what you're really saying is that I'm not paying the rate that would that would that would entice people to come work for me. What I'm saying is I have a job available. I may have a job available. I may think I have a job available, but I'm not willing to pay the rate that the labor would come in and do perform that job. And if I would raise my price to the level that would entice workers to come into my company and do the work I seem to think that they need to do, then that would immediately eliminate the labor shortage because there would be no labor shortage. It's just simply the I'm negotiating the from a wrong wage rate. And why am I not raising the labor wage? Because me as a business, it's 2018 or it's 2020. I've gone through this three, four times already. There's a boom, there's a recovery, says central banker or president. But in the real economy, I'm not quite seeing it. I've been fooled once, twice, thrice, and now thrice. And that's why I'm not going to raise the wages. That's, that's because... really the pickle, isn't it, Emil? Because it's, it's look, you know, if in an economy that's truly robust, and I can you can forgive people for not, not really appreciating this because it's been so long since we've seen anything like that, that we've kind of forgotten what a real recovery or a real, a real economic boom looks like. It doesn't look anything like this. Hmm. Um, when a real economic, you know, in a period of real actual prosperity and growth, businesses aren't so, they're not going to manage their costs and overmanage their costs in this fashion. They're going to say, look, I've got work orders coming in. I need people to, to do the work. I don't care what the wage rate is. Pay the person so we can get it done and, you know, book the sales and get everything, you know, profits and everything else. You know, business is truly good. If you're saying, well, you know, business might be good and we might need a few people and I'm only willing to pay this for them, that's an indication that we're not really in an economic boom. Things might be moving in the right direction, but if businesses are still reluctant to pay what they're supposed to, or what they need to pay to attract labor, that's a very different situation than what is described constantly, as you pointed out during these periods over and over again, that the economy is really booming except employers are not acting like that's the case. They're continuously very cautious and over-managing their cost structure, and their biggest cost is, of course, labor. And they're, they're simply not paying where there actually is labor short or where there actually is a, labor or a need for labor. They're not paying the market clearing wage. And we know that because they complain all the time about it. There's, you know, the, we, we used to joke a couple of years back, back in – Toronto in 2018 about how there would be a story in the Wall Street Journal every day about companies who couldn't find workers. And they were using these all these creative ways, these perks and incentives to try to, to, to entice workers into their company when the answer is you don't need to be creative. It's really simple and really easy and boring. Just raise the wage rate and you'll have all the workers that you need. Earlier, we went over a couple of statistics, employment statistics. Now we're going to bring in a few more. We're going to reference your article that you posted at Alhambra Investments at the blog over there. You posted it on the 1st of September. The title of the article is Yes and No, Taper to Labor and Inflation. And we're going to go, earlier I mentioned IHS Market. Now we're going to go to ISM, PMI Estimates. And the PMI estimate, the headline one, wasn't too good. You're welcome to go over that. But I wanted to focus on the, the, oh, wait, wait, wait. Employment I reversed index. it. Yes. That one was okay. It's the employment one that wasn't so good. Save me, Jeff. What did I mean? What did I want to say? Well, the headline, the headline number crept up a little bit, which was, which was, I guess, it's sort of okay, but. Uh, especially considering a lot of PMIs, including those in China, around the rest of the world have been falling precipitously, China, China, China. Um, so the fact that the ISM manufacturing headline index didn't fall was was itself a good thing. But what we want to look, you know, what, what's important about the ISM's numbers, especially, not just manufacturing, but also non-manufacturing, is that there's been this tremendous divergence between the, the PMI headline and the PMI for its uh, employment component which is something that's relatively new. And it's trying, again, economists, the mainstream media, whatever, they're trying to explain this and reconcile this divergence as, well, that must be the labor shortage, that the workers are, are getting paid too much by the federal government to sit home, this $300 unemployment bonus, whatever it is. There's something preventing labor from getting off the couch and going to work because apparently by the headline of PMI number, there's a lot of work to be done. 
And that's not necessarily the case. And what's probably most important about the ISM's employment index is not just that it fell below 50 for the second time in the last three months in August. So there's relatively weak, relatively weak conditions indicated by that. But the fact that it's really slowed down considerably since that, taint, that same time frame that keeps coming up over and over and over and over again, March and April, March and April, we always we see a lot of not just employment data, not just U.S. data, but all around the world, it seems like the slowdown that, that we're all starting to, to, to talk about and analyze now, that's really when it started to show up. And it has, it seems to have had a pretty consistent impact in the U.S., even in the U.S. labor market, despite the idea that, you know, the payroll reports outside of this latest one have been exceedingly robust and the unemployment rate continues to fall. When you look at a lot of the U labor market data that aren't those headline numbers, that's really kind of what you see. We talk about in that article ADP's numbers as well. March and April, and then thereafter, the, the global economy seems to have hit a real serious slowdown that actually has impacted even the U.S. labor market. So maybe it isn't labor shortage preventing a robust economy and companies operating in a robust economy from hiring workers that they really want, but don't seem willing to pay. Maybe it really is the fact that companies are worried about whether this slowdown is actually something serious and material. And that's the reason not really willing to, they're not enthusiastically falling all over themselves to procure whatever employees they possibly can at whatever rate the, those, those potential employees want to be paid. Maybe it's because companies have a reason to be cautious. Yes, they have work that they might need to be done, but it doesn't seem like it's one of their first line priorities to get labor in the door to actually perform that kind of a, because they believe that that, that work is gonna continue on into the future. I find it somewhat condescending towards the American worker that the the, meat, the establishment says that they're not going to get off the couch for $300. Jeff, I don't know what kind of a shopper you are, but I can't stretch $300 for that amount of time. It seems like, oh, $300 and I'm, I'm not going to go to work unless I get $300 more. I don't, I don't, you know, condescending is what I'm going to describe it. You just well, you said, know, they always said that economics is a dismal science, and oh. maybe they're, you know it's it's deeply misanthropic in some respects too, right? Because it's, as you're right, and it's it's not just now. We talked about this a lot, 2018, 2019. The last time the labor shortage showed up, it was it was back then described as the same thing: lazy Americans who won't get up off the couch or go back to school and learn to code. All these other, it, we're blaming the 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 American worker for a problem in the American labor market, which is, to me is absolutely patently absurd, but we have to do that or they have to do that because otherwise they'd look at the labor market very differently and then have to look at the economy very differently. Remember what was going on then, which is the exact same going on now. Are we heading off into an inflationary sunset recovery? That was certainly everybody's opinion in 2018 that was rudely interrupted by reality in, in late 2018 and 2019, which proved that there ever was a labor shortage to begin with. It was simply this idea, starting from the premise that the economy must be doing well because Jay Powell and Janet Yellen said so, therefore we have to explain why all these other reasons that show the economy is not doing well can't be because the economy is not doing well. And that's really what economics has turned into, is starting with a, a, a a premise that's being falsified by the data and then trying to falsify the falsifying data, which is the exact opposite of what we should be doing. And all of those things that were done wrong the last time are being done wrong again in exactly the same way for the same stupid reason, which is we're starting from the premise that the economy must be doing really well, but because there are problems in the labor market, we have to explain them in a way that preserves the idea that the economy is doing really well, rather than looking at the labor market that's struggling and showing lots of apparent signs of at least slowing down, at best slowing down, and realizing that that might be the signal we need to look at and then interpret the rest of everything, including the economic situation, from that perspective. We don't need to go backwards here. Automatic data processing, they're the ones that provide that uh 
chart that we just saw that we're going to reference again, the slowdown in hiring. And here's what their, their economists had to say. Our data, which represents all workers on a company's payroll, has highlighted a downshift in the labor market recovery. We have seen a decline in new hires following significant job growth from the first half of the year. And Jeff, I want to draw everyone's attention to this fantastic pattern that we have seen repeatedly that you have drawn out for us. This is the monthly change in ADP survey, uh, and you can explain exactly what's happening here, but we've seen it. Where have we seen it? We've seen it in inflation, inflation data, the CPIs, right? It's, and personal income and yep, spending, yep. which I'm going to yeah. just zoom down to. And you label it, Jeff, these peaks, the peaks are associated with choppers. Yeah, there's no, it's, I mean, I'm not providing anybody insight here and there's, there's no surprises except if you're an economist, right? These peaks and valleys correlate with whether or not the government is throwing cash into the economy. That's really all it is. Now, the difference is for, for mainstream economists and those like the central bankers like Jay Powell, they believe especially fiscal stimulus of that sort is actually stimulus. What we mean by stimulus wow. is that it doesn't yeah. have a, just a short run impact when the, when the cash goes in and then it, then it disappears. That's not stimulus. Stimulus is that the cash goes in, it ignites the virtuous circle of economics, and then it continues to take off. It lasts, it lasts more than a couple of months. At least that's the theory. But in Priming practice, the pump. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, you fell the, over. Let me get you up and off you go. But no, exactly. you're debilitated. So I pick you up. You fall down again. I pick you up and now <laughs> I'm stimulating really you. Walk. Right. It's like injecting somebody with cocaine and then they as soon as the cocaine high wears off, they're half dead again, right? It's it's all that's really happened. In reality, we've seen this time and time again. Economists continue to put a positive multiplier on, on fiscal act, uh, fiscal stimulus activity when in fact it, you know, especially in these situations where the economy is in really bad shape. It can't have anything other than a temporary short run impact. And so it, when you get away from the neo-Keynesian ideology that, that worships this kind of activity and therefore is always seeking to validate the theory rather than looking at data to potentially falsify the theory, when you look at the actual data, when you get past that ideology, this isn't any surprise. Once the checks were flown out through the digital helicopter of the, the Treasury Department, yes, it had short run impacts, but then what? It was not a surprise. I don't think it was a surprise to businesses either that this was going to wear off. I think maybe it was a little bit more surprising that how quickly it may have worn off. And in some respects, that may answer the question of why businesses aren't paying market clearing wages for labor. They're not really sure they're going to need for the long run. Because yeah, they might need it. They might need it. Well, they might have needed it yesterday. They might not necessarily need it today. And they're really concerned about whether or not they really want to load up on employees for tomorrow that isn't going the way that everything has been, it's the way, certainly the way that uh, it has been mapped out in the mainstream media in Jay Powell's new inflationary taper stance and everything else. Why would you hire employees, which you can't get rid of very quickly, right? Those wages are sticky. If you look at this chart in the United States, at least, where the consumption is 62 thirds or seven tenths of the economy here we're looking at personal consumption expenditure you drew the all important dash line the trend and we can see how before the covid's arrived in december 2018 we fell off the trend fell off even further just before the lockdowns hit and we've recovered kind of but not to the trend and now it's flattened out so you yeah know, it when makes... did it flatten out again uh, March. There it shows March and April. Again, those months show up everywhere. And what happened in March and April? March and April was when the last helicopter from the Treasury Department was flown. And so ever, ever since the, that dose of cash hit the U.S. economy, and remember, the U.S. economy is the outlier. The U.S. economy is the one that's doing better than most. And as you just showed on that chart, better than most means we haven't even returned to trend yet. Despite all of those trillions in, Fed in Uncle Sam's dollars and nickels and pennies, it hasn't even it hasn't even led to a re actual recovery. And ever since those that helicopter went back to its its base in the Treasury Department, things haven't been you know they haven't been continuously accelerating. 
they have slowed down. Now they haven't come, they haven't crashed. It's not like things are just falling apart without it, but we're not seeing any further acceleration, which is what I think has gotten a, a hell of a lot of attention and certainly in the bond market and the US dollar exchange and all these other financial indications, which are sort of kind of saying, we told you so. We told you this was gonna happen. These things, these impacts were gonna be transitory. This really isn't a surprise. And if you're still thinking that this is a labor shortage, well, we told you what was going to happen by falling yields. Then it did happen. And that thing that did happen wasn't the labor shortage. It was a slowdown, a material slowdown in the global economy. We've gone over four economic statistics. I'm going to add two more that came in this morning. The first one, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. The U.S. economy added 235,000 jobs in the August of 2021 the lowest in seven months and well below forecasts of 750,000 as a surge in COVID-19 infections may have discouraged companies from hiring and workers from actively looking for a job. Now let's go to the services. Well, before you, I mean, look, that, that, that explanation makes it sound like this is just a problem in August, which by the establishment survey, that seems to be the case, right? We've had lots of really good payroll numbers up until this point, and then we have an August that seems to be an outlier. So if you're just, you know, somebody, you know, layperson, member of the public, and all you really find to follow the economy is the payroll report, that kind of sounds like it's a legitimate, plausible explanation. You don't know about all this other stuff that's going on. You don't pay attention to the bond market, of course. You look at the stock market. You get the wrong picture of what may be going on in the economy. And this idea that it's all based on, it's all Delta COVID, kind of sounds like it maybe has maybe that's really what's happening there's a labor shortage there's covid it sounds plausible but when you step back and look at all the other data it's yeah there's something else going on here because all the rest of the data august was not the only month where we've seen problems it's been a it's been a growing issue because there's been a slowing issue for many you know we're talking about going back to march you know it's half a year already Financial Times about an hour ago, U.S. job growth slows sharply as Delta hits recovery. Let's go to another statistic. The Earlier we talked about manufacturing ISM. Now, this morning, we got the ISM services. And the headline number was good-ish, you know. Economic activity in the service sector grew in August for the 15th month in a row. Great. We're here to talk about the economic, blah, the employment part. Okay. Here's what the news release said. Employment activity in the service services sector grew in August for the second consecutive month after contracting in June. The index registered 53.7 in August, down 0.1 percentage point from July's reading of 53.8. Comments from respondents include, we are hiring at record levels to staff our restaurants, but turnover is high and many former employees are still on extended unemployment and have not returned to work. Also, increasingly difficult to find qualified candidates to fill open positions. Jeff, that's it for me on the employment front. Uh, any summary thoughts? Yeah, this, this is not just a recent development. This, as we said before, this goes back six months already, like the bond market and bond yields, which again, we're warning you that this kind of a, this kind of a pattern was emerging, in not just in the US economy, but the global economy. And the fact that we're now seeing it emerge in US labor data suggests that it's probably something more serious and simply just labor shortage, can't find workers, lazy Americans, those damn lazy Americans who won't work for an extra 300 bucks or you know, for the lack of an extra $300 or whatever, whatever excuse is thrown out there. There's, there's more, much more going on here than those surface analysis that you'll see that just, oh, just the, the August payroll number's off, it's just a one month aberration. It's more than a one month aberration and it has a lot more behind it than just the, the establishment survey. In part two of this episode, we're going to talk about those lazy, average Americans and how, for years, they have correctly been predicting which direction, what the temperature of the economy is at a better rate than the fancy, highly credentialed economists.